And so we're going to pick it up here, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to take this in sections, and this particular section is uh, verses 19 through 21. Uh, before I go on, though, I do have to pass on some comments. Uh, I could see last week our beloved pastor itching to come and say a comment uh, afterwards. Where did our beloved pastor go? Oh, now I can talk about, oh, is he next door? Okay, oh, okay, so we can talk about him. Um, so anyway, he uh, came and showed me, you know, we talked about power and endurance, dunamis or dynamite, you know, that kind of a power. And, uh, and so he, he pointed out throughout chapter 2, be strong, endure, endure, endure. Uh, and, and tie that together with the military that enlisted as soldiers and it's not that we did the enlisting, but we were drafted. Now apply that specifically to the pastorate. And this is a good reminder that pastors are called. They were drafted into this. And the admonition is to endure in the preaching and the teaching, which is not a sprint. This baby's a marathon. Uh, this is, goes on long, long and hard. And that's amidst hardship and suffering and persecution built upon hardship and hardship. Sometimes you get uh, glimpses of fruit. Other times you get uh, knocked down. And so as I say that, not just related to David, but related to all of our pastors. Uh, in my newfound role, I've been spending a lot of time visiting with a lot of different pastors throughout uh, the RCUS. And I am reminded once again uh, the challenges that they endure. So please do remember our, our pastors in prayer and support. Um, okay, so based on all that, let's uh, start off verse 19. Uh, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So it starts with nevertheless. To understand this nevertheless, we have to go back to verses 17 to 18 and 18 to see why verse 19 opens with nevertheless. And so we get to verse 17. Uh, and their message will spread like cancer. This is talking about those who would introduce heresy into the church and then cites a couple of examples. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who has strayed concerning the truth. In this case, it's dealing with the resurrection. So now that's an introduction of heresy. But now Paul, on verse 19, goes to nevertheless. Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus were evidently prominent people in the church due to having been named. In spite of the lies and heresies spread by these two people, the elect will remain steadfast. That's the message here. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. And we talk about foundation. Foundation could refer to the elect of the church. Uh, you know, the subsequent uh, statement there, the Lord knows who are his, may indicate that we're talking about the elect. Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 20 talks about uh, the elect, the foundation of the church as the foundation. Uh, or foundation could refer to the word of God, which stands firm throughout all ages and doesn't change. Or the foundation could be Christ himself, who is called the foundation of the church, 1 Corinthians 3 verse 11. Uh, or it may apply each to every one equally applicable but here we find this solid foundation of God stands having this seal the Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity this seal is literally and figuratively used as authenticity you've seen you know you've heard that example in the old time you dip drip the wax, and then the seal goes on. Well, that's authenticity. 
the foundation of God will not be moved. We know this. This is sealed. The Lord knows his elect. His elect will not be taken from him. John 10, 29. Uh, the elect will not be snatched out of his hand. Or Romans 8, 38 and 39, one of the most comforting passages throughout Scripture. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that's going to separate us from the love of God. The Lord knows his elect. That way we can confidently go back and say, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Though there be some who claim to be Christian, the Lord knows the heart and the fruit thereof. Uh, those who confess Christ are thus warned not to get caught up in heresy or falsehood, which is here described as straying from the foundational truths of Scripture. So like before, we're going to take things a verse or a section at a time and then introduce an application to it. So by way of application, not unlike the days of Hymenaeus and Philetus, uh, churches throughout history and even today have been devastated by those who would introduce harmful doctrine, take up uh, or those who would take up singular causes that end up substituting that cause for the gospel and or are frankly consistently consensuous, contentious. Yet while these things can and do happen, we can be assured that the church of Christ and the cause of the gospel will continue through his remnant. We're further warned to be on guard for such iniquity from both our th others and ourselves. And that's part of the reason why we're admonished to stir up love and good works with one another. Hebrews 10, 24. Go to verse 20 now. Verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. So then... When, when that word, when the sentence starts with but, uh, it's either going to mean a continuance or a moreover or a further explanation, or it's going to open with as opposed to. So in this case, it's used as moreover. Uh, in this context, it's a further elaboration of the previous. Um, uh, Moreover, or furthermore, as if responding to an objection of why unbelievers like Hymenaeus and Philetus would be in the church, much less prominent people in the church who are not true Christians. We know he's talking about the church, uh, great and house put together in the original literally means a very large house and refers to the church. There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wooden clay. Uh, vessels here is being used as an illustration of people. We see this illustration also in Romans chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. There are vessels of mercy and there are vessels of wrath. In this case, there are vessels of gold and silver and there are vessels of wood and clay. Uh, the uh, elect versus the non-elect. Within the church, there are true believers, gold and silver, and unbelievers, wood and clay. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us that the church is made up of wheat and tares. Uh, Jesus told us that, that the visible church includes both those who believe and those who don't. This is the reality that no church is perfectly and utterly pure. Uh, this does not mean, however, that we constantly look for and highlight the faults of others. Rather, as brothers and sisters in the church, we are to think the best of one another, love one another. Remember, love covers a multitude of sins, First Peter 4, verse 8. Nevertheless, we don't want to be naive either. If one named a brother or sister clearly is enticing you to sin, is teaching something contrary to the gospel or is living in unrepentant sin, then we turn to Matthew 18 and confronting one another in love. Now we go to verse 21. Verse 21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, referring to the wooden clay, 
He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Uh, therefore, again, the flag goes up. That means the conclusion of the matter. In this matter, it actually uh, directly began in verse uh, 14. I'm going to look back on verse 14. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words, to no profit to the ruin of hearers. So directly, this therefore is concluding that statement. Indirectly, it actually started at verse 2 when Paul was admonishing Timothy to recruit faithful teachers. Um, so we look back at verse 14 to see again to whom God is directing these instructions. These instructions are being laid out to the faithful teachers, the faithful teachers that Timothy is recruiting. Having instructed Paul to train these faithful men to endure hardship and suffering, he adds the instruction to not engage in fruitless arguments by those like Hymenaeus and Philetus who would stray from the foundational truths of the gospel. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, so now here's a conditional clause. If this, then that. The latter here refers to vessels of wood and clay, those who are not true believers. You recognize them by their fruit. And what you do is cleanse, which means to cleanse thoroughly, purge, or separate from. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 gives us an example of this word being used to cleanse the church. Um, individually, this means to stay away from or separate from those in the church who teach that which is contrary to the sound doctrine of biblical truth. To the church, this means careful selection of church officers according to biblical qualifications, which was part of Timothy's first letter, or Paul's first letter to Timothy, as well as in Titus. It also means the church is to exercise church discipline with those who would subvert the church or live unrepentantly. And so if the church is practicing these things, then the church and the members thereof will be vessels for honor. These faithful teachers or elders will be vessels for honor. Remember, this is addressed to the faithful men recruited as teachers. To not come into the influence of heretical teaching sets up the teachers to not only be vessels of silver and gold, but also vessels of honor, doing the work of the Lord. We find this also in 1 Peter 5, verse 4. It goes on to say, Sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Uh, sanctified, literally here, it means to be made holy, to be separate. The master's use is one word. Uh, and, it's, and I think this is uh, very well translated. Other... Uh, other Bibles call this uh, for the Lord's use. So uh, Lord typically is translated from uh, this word. But this word is uh, different that's used here. Which looks like that. Which carries with it uh, a deeper sense of uh, the Lord's ownership. So not just our Lord, but this turns it around and has a deeper sense of us being owned by the Lord, being, uh, he being our owner. It's also referenced in 2 Peter 2, verse 1. And so by way of application on this verse, the church that is zealous for guarding and promoting the truth will, will uh, seek faithfully to select and train up only those men who meet biblical qualifications and who also are not prone to coming under the influence of heretical teaching. Also, while the context of this passage is directed to faithful men who are teachers, clear reference to church officers, this is likewise true for every believer in the church, whether a church officer or a member of the church, by staying clear of false teaching and contentiousness the result of such diligence is the joy 
of being used by Christ for the good of the church, producing much good fruit. After all, the reason for our salvation is not simply that we would go to heaven, although that is a big deal, but that's ultimately not the reason for our salvation, but to more and more know God and express such knowledge through more and more good works. Um, back to the sanctified for good works. To be prepared is to make ready. Uh, one note, to leave on a trip without preparation or to wage a battle without preparation is foolish. Uh, being sanctified and useful for the master is to be prepared for what? For every good work. Therein lies the product, well, that which we produce. So by now you can see where this letter is going. Uh, Paul continues to build the case, and what's happening, you can kind of see it building and building and building until it reaches a crescendo. And that crescendo, we know in advance, that waterfall or that crescendo is coming up is all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So that's the crescendo that this is all leading toward. So faithful teachers, build them up, be ready for persecution and suffering, watch out for heresy, and so he continues to build up that argument. And that takes us to the next section, chapter 2, verses 22 through 26. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And so here we see the flow of Paul's admonition, addressing Timothy and the faithful teachers or elders, and by extension, all of God's people. We are sealed as those who belong to God, therefore depart from iniquity and cleanse ourselves of those who would draw us away from sound doctrine. You see the center point there is the sound doctrine. Um, but Paul here is also saying it's more than simple sound doctrine. He adds in the verse 22 in the following the application of sound doctrine. So, you know, I, I hear all the time, you know, doctrine is boring and doctrine is, is this and it's intellectual arguments. Well, doctrine isn't doctrine that stands alone. Doctrine also carries forward into how we live. It's because of doctrine that we do things, that we think certain ways, that we believe and, 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 and emanate and produce fruit accordingly. So let's take a look at some practical examples that Paul gives. And the first thing he says is to flee youthful lusts. To flee is to run away. We look at the word lust um, right here, and that is the desire that which is forbidden. Okay, so we're going to pick on young people here because now we have to ask the question, why would Paul give reference to youthful lusts? Um, well, remember, the letter was primarily addressed to Timothy, also to us as a church. Timothy was still a young man. This also points to the need for elders and teachers with maturity. Now, it's not that maturity inoculates a person from lust. It's just that experience is supposed to give greater capacity to avoid these lusts. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, because of doctrine, flee these youthful lusts. But, over and against these youthful lusts, Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. Instead of being lured away by lust, such as unsound doctrine, Timothy and the teachers, by extension, are called to pursue righteousness. In this case, uh, when you look at the word for righteousness, uh, this is referring to righteousness. Pretend I spelled it right. Uh, righteousness which refers to uh, that which is acceptable to God. That is righteousness. 
And so what is it that's acceptable to God? Well, God's law, right? Uh, so God's law, um, obedience to God's law. We pursue obedience even though we fall short. We're never going to do this perfectly, but that is our pursuit. Uh, we are also called to pursue faith, not just righteousness, but also faith, which makes sense following righteousness because it is faith in Christ's righteousness that delivers us and allows us to move forward. We grow in faith through the means of grace. And what else do we pursue? We pursue love. Uh, several references uh, we find in Galatians 5 and 2 John 1, verse 6. Uh, one of my favorites is Romans 12, 3. Uh, love thinks of others more highly than yourself. And so we're to pursue those things. Uh, and it follows with, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So here's the kicker. Timothy, the teachers, and us are to pursue these things with godly people. And remember, this is as opposed to those who teach falsehoods like Hymenaeus and Philetus and those who practice falsehoods, avoiding youthful lusts, unsound doctrine and living. So it's those things together, unsound doctrine and unsound living. By application, this passage is still dealing with Timothy, faithful teachers, and by extension, us. In dealing with those who would seek to pull us away from the truth of God's word. In verse 22, we see that we not only guard against false doctrine, but also against false application. I've seen over the years several who have had the knowledge and could recite that knowledge at the drop of a hat. However, the application in daily living hardly represented that knowledge. I think we've known people like that, and we've seen people like that. Um, we're called to take that knowledge and apply that into daily living. Uh, let's go to verse 23. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Uh, so moreover, back to the teachings of Hymenaeus and Philetus, how would you like to have your name in Scripture as those <laughs> that are not good? Um, so anyway, uh, back to their teaching, instead of that, avoid getting caught up in foolish and ignorant disputes. Foolish meaning dull, stupid, absurd. Calvin calls this kind of argument as uninstructive, contributing nothing to uh, godliness. And it's also called ignorant, which means without instruction uneducated, rude. Does, does anything, any source come to mind when I use these things? Rude, uninstructed, stupid, absurd. Do we find those types of arguments in any particular medium that's prevalent in today's society? Just wondering. Um, Facebook. Or what, what's it supposed to be called now? It's not Facebook. What is it? Meta? Thank you. Oh, that's the parent company. It's still called Facebook? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Ignorant. <laughs> um, while we are to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, we're also admonished not to cast our pearls before swine, Matthew 7, verse 6. The result in engaging with those who only seek to denigrate only those who seek to have an argument or to forcefully impose or are prone to contentiousness is that they generate strife. Now, of course, there are those who would love to draw us away from the truth. And here we must open our eyes to the fact that the social media has emerged as the ideal setting for engaging in foolish and ignorant disputes. We must have enough street sense to recognize when an individual or group is teaching and modeling falsehood and treat it as such. Um, 
and certainly there are insane falsehoods that are out there. It reminds me of, uh, I think I used this illustration before, the animated film An American Tale where the, the rat who is dressed up as a cat, his disguise is knocked off, and he appeals to the audience and says, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's run with uh, our own eyes here. Uh, verses 24 and 25, uh, first part of 25, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. A servant of the Lord is giving reference to Timothy and the faithful teachers. And this word quarrel refers specifically to hand-to-hand -hand combat, combat and a war of words. In both cases, the objective here as quarrel is to prevail over the other, to conquer the other. Okay, uh, there, here's, here's the difference when we engage in these discussions or these arguments and such. Here's the contrast to it. But be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Now notice here how different the approach is for the godly teacher. As opposed to that mindset of conquering, Man, I am going to show you. I am going to destroy your argument in the process. I am not taking prisoners, and I'm going to crush you. I'm going to crush you into submission. We, we've seen those arguments before, but that's not what Paul is talking about. He says, don't do that. Um, he says, as opposed to conquering, Timothy, elders, and us respond to attacks with gentleness, patience, and humility. These three attributes supply the essential elements that a teacher of God must have. Gentleness refers to being mild, kind. Patience refers to being forbearing, enduring of will. Humility is a spirit of gentleness, mildness, meekness. And mixed in that instruction is the ability to teach. That is to teach with knowledge of the truth in such a way that others can understand. So there is teachers who can recite facts, but then there are teachers who can share this knowledge in such a way that it's understandable. Um, this teaching must be accompanied with gentleness, patience, and humility, and here's the big difference. Uh, conquering or correction. So correction, godly correction. Um, but as for how we approach falsehood, we either avoid those who are clearly bent on swaying us from the truth, or we teach with gentleness, patience, and humility to those who appear to seek instruction. And that to those who appear to seek instruction, that explanation is in the following verse. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So typically, not universally, what makes disputes foolish and ignorant is not the topic, but the one who is making the dispute. Hence, by teaching with gentleness, patience, and humility, and not engaging in a fight, one must be motivated by correction. If God would grant repentance, my motivation is your soul. That's what the teacher's mindset is. I am concerned about you. I'm concerned about your soul. A uh, man's natural sinful tendency is to fall in line with the devil and, appro and oppose the truth of God. I uh, see Jesus describing that in John 8 verse uh, 44, and this natural tendency does not seek our best welfare, but rather seeks to destroy us. But that is not our goal. Our goal is for their best welfare through godly correction. Consequently, what Paul is talking about here, we are to avoid engaging those who are clearly seeking to cause strife. Nevertheless, 
If it appears that perhaps God is granting repentance, then by all means we teach with gentleness, patience, and humility. So now we finally into chapter 3. As I look with panic on how in the world are we going to finish this in another week. So uh, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. So Paul is continuing the argument. He said, this is real. This is reality. We've got insanity going on all around us. This suffering, this persecution, these challenges. Uh, you you got to know this. Is there anything special to know? The, while the word gnosis is the act of knowing, the word that's used here is beyond knowing. It's emphasizing understanding. It's like Paul is saying, not just know this intellectually, understand this. But understand this, Timothy, and faithful teachers and the church. Understand this. Uh, reasoning from how to respond to challenges of the Christian faith, Paul is here now inserting street sense. Um, you know, in reference to uh, how how I, I grew up, I know that uh, being a father and wanting to uh, put a bubble around the daughters to protect them from things as they grew up, I also had that sense of, but in the meantime, I got to teach them some street sense too, some reality, some real word. They got real word. They got to know street sense but teaching that in a protective fashion. Um, so this is what the street sense is, that in the last days, the phrase last days, this is going to sound familiar, eschatos. What word do we get from that? Eschatology. There you go. Study of the last days. Uh, the last days, when did the last days begin? Pentecost, the last days began. When, when will the last days end? When Christ returns, and when will that be? <laughs> Lots of shrugs. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's the point. We don't know. We are in the last days, and so in this period that we know is the last days, perilous times will come. The word perilous literally means hard to bear, troublesome. Uh, dangerous times are ahead and even now are here. So now we go to, and so now we get a description in verses 2 through 5. For, of course, for, because, here comes the reason, and the reason is men will be lovers of themselves. That's what it starts with. Ah, okay, now, does this just mean men, those of the male species? Ah, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, sorry, it's uh, the word is anthropos. That should look familiar to you as well. Anthropology, study of, of mankind, refers to humankind, both male and female. But the thing is that people will be lovers of themselves. Um, and then we follow along in, in verses two through five. The next series, this all this begins with a litany of idols. That are all placed above or beside Almighty God. To start off with lovers of themselves is, is perfect. The second great commandment is to love others as, your, as yourself. We have no problem loving ourselves and satisfying our own desires. The call is to have the same care, concern, and compassion for others. Contrarywise, in the last days, the object of love increasingly becomes self. Well, okay, so what follows? Let's follow some idols. Lovers of money. Now, is loving money so bad? I mean, don't we need money to live? Well, the warning comes from 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It's interesting, just to, want, just to point out some observation. Today's society hates the one percenters, right? 
I mean, we got class welfare or warfare that's building up. The one percenters are hated. But loves to entice people to quickly and easily become a one percenter through the lottery. <laughs> you too could become one of those that we hate. All you got to do is play the lottery. Notice too how this is subtly sowing discontent for God's provision. So they're lovers of money. They're boasters, proud blasphemers. What do these three evils have in common? Well, a boaster is drawing attention to self, empty pretender, uh, proud, showing oneself above others, blasphemer, impiety against God, ruining someone's reputation, slanderous. See, all of these are intended to elevate self, which is very reflective of, of being lovers of ourselves. It seems that gone are the days of humility, which have now been replaced by personal demands. I demand that you accept me as such and such, even though by clear uh, reason, by clear visible, that you are not such and such. Uh, those days are gone. They've now been replaced by personal demands elevating self in narcissistic behavior. These people are unthankful, unholy. Uh, that follows being lover of yourself. I'm unthankful to God for all of his provision. I'm unthankful uh, to all those who have contributed to my life. Um, how do we express gratitude to God? Obedience. Unholiness is unthankfulness as expressed in wickedness and disobedience. And then what follows is unloving unforgiving, slanderers, and, you know, those are all tied with each other as well. Uh, Proverbs 10, verse 12, 1 Peter 4, 8 describes those. Uh, note that unloving is the opposite of loving your neighbor and is thus everything contrary to the second table of the law. And unforgiving is contrary to the command in Matthew 18 to forgive. Slanderer, the word for slanderer here, and notice the connection here. Uh, when it says slanderer, this should look familiar, particularly to Spanish students, uh, that word. So that word is also the same word used there as devil, and that's not a... Uh, uh, that's not an accident. What are the dev devil's main tactics? Lies and accusations. Yep. What's slandering? Lies and accusations. False accusation. That's what the devil does. And we are not to follow in his footsteps. Despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty. To despise what is good is to despise the very law of God. Instead, we're to love God's law. A traitor betrays the confidence entrusted to him. To be headstrong is to be rash and reckless with little thought toward others. And haughtiness is to be conceited. Um, and these, it's hard for me to just go past that. I, I, I have to confess to you uh, that uh, throughout my lifetime, that's, that, that is one of the things that, that I've had to work through. Um, um, so, anyway, that's personal confession. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, the two different words, the lovers of pleasure versus the lover of God, the intent on pleasure for self versus loving God. Uh, the mind is set on pleasing self rather than pleasing God. Now, here's an interesting kicker here at the end. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. So take everything that we've talked about up there, and here we have it all packaged in a form of godliness or a semblance of godliness, which is quite different than the power of godliness. The form outwardly shows the accoutrements of the Christian life. I've been baptized, I go to church, I go through the motions without fully believing. Uh, 
the power of godliness is a changed heart with true faith. And here we get the conclusion of the message, which is the same thing we heard in chapter 2, verses 16 through 21, and from such people turn away. So that, phew. Anybody full yet? Because we're <laughs> going to keep marching through. Chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. So ladies, before you pick up tomatoes and start tossing them to me, I'm just telling you what Scripture says. So let's just take a closer look at this. Um, so of what sort, when it says, for of this sort are those who creep into households? Well, we find that sort in verse uh, 5, everything that we just described. Uh, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. It's of that sort that creep into households, making captives of gullible women loaded down with sins. Those who ca either call themselves Christians or are simply nice. This is the same language as described in chapter 2 regarding Philetus and Hymenaeus. On a personal note, and I apologize to uh, those who are in my class, but he's nice. Uh, I give this example. So I had the rich privilege of, of uh, running HYC for 18 years. You still, you guys got enough rest now from camp? Okay, you're built back up. But invariably, at an evening campfire, I'm sitting there, we're singing, we're doing things, and, and a young lady comes to me and just real excited, talking about her new boyfriend and everything. And you know what my question is, don't you? Yeah, is he a Christian? Well, I think so, but he's really nice. <laughs> So, let's go back here and talk about those that are really nice. Um, that's not the standard. The measure is the biblical standard, uh, that which produces good fruit. So, my comment was, well, if you think he's a Christian, he's probably not. Uh, it's going to be really evident if he's a Christian. So, the, the thing that follows is they sneak or they creep in the you know, the, the frog in the hot water example. But now let's take a look at that phrase, making captive of gullible women. Why this reference to gullible women? This is specifically referring to seductive behavior targeting women and loaded down with sins. So, again, let's just be honest here. I mean, the Bible is so very practical. Uh, a loaded, this has a direct impact impact on a woman's self-worth, self-dignity by giving in to previous seductions, oftentimes what happens, dignity begins to erode. This, tied with the desire to be loved, feeds directly into seductive vulnerability. That's a reality of life that we're living in. Um, you know, Women are not exclusively prone to such seductions, but are especially vulnerable. Deny it if we like, but generally speaking, women are drawn to men who give wanted attention. And again, on a personal note, I grew up with this. I watched it unfold right before my very eyes. I've seen it my entire career uh, in youth work. Uh, working against violence is filled with women escaping abuse only to assume responsibility and even desire to return. This is a very real phenomenon. But, you know, Paul here is not using this as an exclusive problem. He's only giving it as an illustration. So here's just a classic illustration of the people to watch for. And in some ways, um, and again, I'll say, in some ways, feminism has a point. I realize, no, stay seated, it's okay. Uh, it's rise being in response to abusive men who fail to love their wives as Christ loved the church. 
So let's go now on to verse 7. After taking a closer look at that one. Verse 7, always learning, talking about uh, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Men and women alike have a propensity toward learning, but unchanged hearts will never come to the full knowledge of the truth. And here, once again, always learning and never able. That word able, well, what word do you think that is, Esther? That able, yeah, has something to do with power, dynamite, yeah, yeah. So that uh, that power, that that uh, do, do non, do, I'm not even gonna try it. Dynamite, the power to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth, the power to believe. And where does that power to believe come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. And knowledge is a derivative of that word gnosis, but this particular knowledge means full discernment, the ability to both understand and apply the truth. Now we get an example. Verse 8, Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. Okay, any idea who those two are? Yeah. Uh, we don't find this from Scripture, at least I haven't found it. But I, uh, ancient Hebrew historians have pointed to these two as being Pharaoh's magicians who sought to duplicate Moses' plagues. Uh, ultimately, they failed. Uh, these seducers are like these magicians that can fake it for a time, but will ultimately fail or ultimately fall apart. Their minds are corrupt, depraved. They are of the lot described in verses 2 through 5. As disapproved, they prove themselves to lack the stamp of authority from the Christian faith as evidenced by wrong doctrine and wrong life. A good modern example of men of corrupt minds, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is an example I gave to the kids, uh, is today's prosperity gospel. That's, another, that's a great example. Preachers that lure billions of dollars of giving from the promise of prosperity. That is false doctrine. False doctrine both in terms of knowledge and in terms of application. Verse 9 now. Uh, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. I'll start off by saying, again, you've, you've, you've probably said this yourself. I've said it before. Uh, you know, we've got all this terrible stuff before us. But remember, we've read the end of the book. We know how it turns out. We know who's going to win. Well, this is a reminder of who's going to win. But they will progress no further. Just as the magician's folly was self-evident, so will be the folly of these seducers who try to lure people away from the truth. Make no mistake, uh, and this is a constant thing that I told the high school class, the world loves darkness and hates light and would like nothing more than to snuff out your light and have you join the darkness. That, um, because of this, Paul has been building a case for the truth of God's word to Timothy, to faithful teachers, and to us. And again, this case will reach a crescendo when we get to verses 15 through 17. But first, in the next eight minutes, we're going to run through chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. All right. Here we go. But you. Now, it's that same word that's being used, but. How is it being used this time? Not as, no, not as moreover. Not as a continuing argument, it's a stop, not this, this. But you, Timothy, you, faithful teachers, you, members of the congregation, um, uh, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, persecution, 
So instead of being like the gullible women, instead of being like those who creep into the households, have carefully followed my doctrine. Now this would indicate that Paul is saying he is not like the pretenders. Paul cites multiple reasons why he can be trusted as opposed to a, those identified in verses 1 through 9. And we'll take a look at some of those. Um, that, uh, that word uh, doctrine, by the way, uh, is yet another proof that what he is teaching is not unique to Paul. When he says, I carefully following my doctrine, this is not stuff invented by Paul. And again, he is saying, just like I said last week, I was teaching my class. It doesn't mean that I created my class. It doesn't mean that I created the stuff that I was teaching. Uh, but I still refer to it as my class. Well, Paul is saying it in the much the same way. Uh, the use of the particular word here for doctrine is another proof that what he's teaching is not unique to Paul, but encapsulates that which is taught throughout Scripture. Um, the first is his doctrine. Um, to give weight to the doctrine and demonstrating that he can be trusted, he then adds his manner of life. And his manner of life was always on display. His purpose was always transparent in the pursuit that the truth of the gospel be set forth to the glory of God. His faith was unwavering. He patiently ran the race with endurance. He was driven by the love of God and godly love for others and steadily persevered and would not be deterred from these purposes. His manner of life was on display. Friends, our manner of life, it's constantly on display. Our manner of life, whether we like it or not, gives credence to or opposes that which we teach. Um, you know, sometimes I use this, and I say this with a, with a grain of salt, so don't, don't, uh, uh, don't come down too hard on me, but a quote has been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, who is purportedly to have said, teach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. I get it. I get it. We are to teach this stuff. But unless our manner of life is not, is, is how do I say it? Unless it's uh, consistent, I'm too many negatives in there. We got to live according to how we teach. How's that? Um, well, that's what Paul is saying. His manner of life, his purpose, faith, long-suffering, uh, manner of life, you know my ways, my behavior, purpose, uh, prothesis, from the word would mean that means to place before one's self, to set forth, uh, faith, which means to trust, to have confidence in, long-suffering is patience and endurance. The word love that he gives here is the word agape. Uh, perseverance, uh, steadfastness, constancy, and un endurance, unswerved from deliberate purpose, even in trials and sufferings. And then he goes on to give some examples. Persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Paul's manner of life was made more challenging by these persecutions and afflictions. Antioch. What happened in Antioch? Paul was stoned at Antioch and left for dead. Uh, at Iconium, Gentiles and Jews together with their rulers made a violent attempt to abuse and stone Paul. At Lystra, after healing a lame man, the people sought to make sacrifices to Paul, believing him to be a god. These are the things that he had to suffer through. Now contrast that. Unlike those who would seek to deceive or devour, Paul suffered through persecutions and afflictions. He had every reason to abandon the spread of the gospel, but instead steadfastly endured. This provides all the more reason to believe that Paul is not like the pretenders. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And where does credit go? To reaching deep down inside himself 
Uh, no, it was the Lord who delivered him. It's the Lord who delivers us. And Lord here is the Kyrios that we're talking about up here. Uh, and this specific reference to God, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was delivered from death, from violence, and from his own vanity. Uh, and again, unlike the pretenders, evidence of the truth is found in Jesus delivering Paul from death, from violence, and from his opportunity to build up a following people, of a following of people who see him as a God. And, you know, I just a personal note that I pass on to, uh, to the class. There are those in our lives that have a great deal of influence, which is normally brought about how they live, their manner of life. And I think I mentioned that to you once, and I won't go through the names, but, you know, one man in particular, I, as, I, as I reflect upon it, I realize you have no idea how much of his personality is in me uh, and how it's conveyed every day. It's that kind of an impact that he had on me. Verses 12 and 13, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Ah, there's a guarantee. There's something you can take to the bank. Uh, so by becoming a Christian, your life will be prosperous. You're going to have just a nice, clean, smooth ice, clear sea. No, no, that's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, you want to live godly in Christ? Get ready for hardship suffering, persecution, because that's what's before you. Paul now points out that the suffering he endured uh, was not unique to him. But again, he reiterates that godliness will always be under attack. When we talk about godliness, this refers to a manner of life. Uh, interestingly, this particular word does not have in view a simple obedience to God's law, although the law is the basis for obedience. Rather, the word has in view a life of faith faith that is marked by humility, repentance, love, and devotion. And where's that faith? In Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Um, the word from which we get godliness is not uniquely Christian. The secular use of the word referred to living according to whatever moralistic standard the person or persons adopt. So when we go back to that, uh, uh, the word here is specifically this, it's translated godliness. In a secular world, it's high moral, what it is. And so Paul here clarifies, this isn't just a morality of the secular world. This is Christian. It is uniquely Christian. Those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. So now we're talking about uh, true truth. Therefore, the desire to live godly in Christ Jesus is to daily engage in a repentant lifestyle of killing off the old man of sin, bringing to life the new man and consistently exercising the means of grace. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Um, these are hurtful, harmful uh, men. Evil seeks to harm us. We already talked about imposters, deceivers. It's a summary of what was said earlier deceiving, causing to stray. And so remember the context of this passage is for Timothy and faithful teachers. However, by extension, we are to observe the same warnings. As was said before, there is a target on our back. There is no running away from this fight. And monastery is not the answer. Living in a yurt in Siberia or Mongolia, that is not the answer. Uh, we are not, we are in a war whether we like it or not. And the other side is tenacious. But we have in our arsenal an unmatched weapon. Verses 14 and 15. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them. It's time to reach in the arsenal and exercise the nuclear option. You can see where this is going. Building up to that crescendo, verses 16 and 17, continue uh, that which you have learned. Of course, what did he learn? From a child, 
what did he learn? He learned the scriptures. That's what it's building up to. He learned the scriptures. And from whom he learned them? Mom and grandma. Or what did we say? Grandma Lois? Or, or Mama, Mama Eunice and Grandma Lois? Or did I get that turned around? Oh, Grandma Lois and Mother Eunice. There you go. They were constant in his life. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. That word childhood refers specifically to fetus or infant. He knew, he knew the scriptures even while he was in mom's uh, womb. <laughs> I mean, that was the life that he was brought up in. He knew that from the very beginning. Um, what a blessing. Um, and the scriptures uh, literally letter and refers to that which was written, both the Old Testament and New Testament uh, letters in Paul's hand, a holy scripture. Uh, and then, I'm, I'm just skating through this part here, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Understanding in a positive application our salvation. Um, so just a couple of comments and then we'll close. This is all Timothy has ever known. But that knowledge was not just academic. Um, but was able to see that knowledge play out in front of him through his grandmother and mother. Compare this to Judges 2, verse 10, whose children did not have understanding. Learning takes place through speaking and by doing. Uh, the adults neither systematically taught the children nor did their lives reflect that teaching. Timothy knew it, saw it, lived it out, and experienced it. So you... Young people, you are growing up in this. You are seeing this. Many of you have learned this since you were in the womb. What a rich blessing that you have received, having learned, and now you're in a position of applying this very thing. The primary weapon here in combating all this stuff is the Word of God. It's no wonder that Satan formed his first attack on the word. As God said, it's no wonder that Jesus himself went straight to the word when being tempted. It's no wonder that Ephesians 6 verse 17 identifies the sword of the spirit as the word of God. For that is our primary weapon that cannot be defeated. That is the nuclear option. And so, next up, next week, we jump right away into verses 16 and 17.